Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Zenek Prickro from Codasip, who's going to talk today about challenges of working with RISC-V. So Zenek, as we get into the more widespread use of RISC-V, you have a couple different classes of users, one of which is very advanced. The other one is companies that are really startups and are just beginning to work with this stuff and beginning to look at how they're going to use this in the market. What sort of problems do each of them run into? Well, that depends, as you mentioned, on the, uh, on the users and the things that they are looking at. So a uh, good thing is that the uh, RISC-V, uh, the ecosystem and the tools around that, these tools are there. You can find them uh, either on the open source, in the open source world, or there are commercial great tools as well. So if you are looking for a CPU that you would like to use as a small startup, then you are pretty much set because you can go and you can either use the uh, the open source part, including a tool chain or even open source implementation, the RISC-V, or you can go and you can use a commercial grade CPUs such as Codasib has or other vendors has. So there, uh, especially if you go to the uh, commercial grade course, then you are pretty much set. So there is no big troubles because you get the RTL in really good shape. You get the SDK that works. Everything's nicely packed there. And you as a user or a startup, you should have everything you need to, to play with and to integrate that tool. Now, in the case of the high-end users, where we are looking at the, uh, the HPC class, with the application layers and these kind of things. Well, in this case, the risk five is not there yet. Uh, and we have some homework to do, such as for instance, the hypervisor in terms of the virtualization or other parts related to the high-end domain. So then if you are looking for something advanced, like in this domain, then you can hit an issue because even the commercial grade CPUs are not there yet because the specifications are not finished and are still work in progress. So you should be aware of this one. Let's drill down into this. Sure. Zenek, what are we looking at here? Well, what you can see here is a high level picture where we can see that we have a risk five CPU here in the middle and then Assuming that uh, you are looking for something that's not available in the of the shelf configurations or in the case of ratified extensions, then you can go and you can add your own instruction set extension. If you don't want to uh, touch the ISAN and you don't want to play with the instruction set extension, then risk five is also offering the coprocessor interface. So then you can plug your own see uh, your own logic there to accelerate the computation, for instance. What if you find that the off-the-shelf CPU doesn't meet your requirements? In this case, you have uh, several options. The obvious one is, as we can see in this picture, is that you can go and you can define the extension that actually helps to meet your requirement. If you look at the RISC-V ISA, it's designed in the modular way already. So we have uh, some tangents that are already ratified, such as the integer arithmetic, floating point units, and these kind of things. And we have, we have also the ISA modules that are not ratified, uh, such as P extension or V extension. And then you can even go beyond that, because you can define your own extension that helps your application. Now, how you find these extensions? Well, you can use the profiling tools that helps you with that approach. So you can find the right instructions for you, or uh, you have uh, you know, expertise to do that. And you can, for instance, tune the RISC-V towards the signal processing or image processing by adding something there. So then you actually create something new and actually RISC-V encouraged to do so because it already tells you how to do the customization and it supports innovation. Because then if you do something like that, you bring some added value into your CPU, into your, you add your own key differentiation point, and then it meets your environment because you are able to either uh, you know, fulfill the throughput or the overall performance, however, whatever. When you add in a custom extension, how difficult is that? How do you actually do that? If I simplify that, we have a two approaches. 
one i call it like manual approach it means that you need to change things uh, manually you need to patch rtl you need to change the uh, compiler uh, simulator verification environment and so on there is nothing wrong with this approach you can do that and you can see it even nowadays but it's time consuming challenging if you don't have right people and therefore it's expensive now what if you can automate something on the list that i just tell so in this uh, in this way you can uh, maybe automate the compiler creation or rtl generation and this is the second half or second way how you can do the custom extensions so you can leverage the automation uh, one of the uh, type of the automation is through some kind of high level uh, language so you describe extension in the high language it can be uh, like in the case of a Coda city's code language it can be uh, other other languages we know chisel for instance so then you rise the abstraction and then you are more productive because you can capture the extension in one way in one description click on the button and you get in the best case rtl automatically compiler automatically pretty much everything from a single source so then every tool knows you know, about the extension and uh, you are fine as well because you don't have to spend significant amount of time on the verification because you do everything in a single source and then you get the output what about a software developer kit that's uh, something uh, connected to the automation as well so one thing is that you can do it manually and again there's nothing wrong with that or you can leverage the automation like a codasib has meaning that you describe the instruction set in high level description language and the among the other things the compiler is one of the products of the generation flow so then the compiler is aware of every single instruction that you added to the instruction set extension. And then the compiler is smart enough to use this extension automatically. So you don't have to change the C code necessarily. Of course, if you want to change it, you can. If you have really complex instructions, then you need to go to the intrinsic level or inline assembly, that's for sure. But in the case of, uh, let's say, instructions such as uh, CMD operations, bit money, and these kind of things that are being ratified at this stage, compiler can handle this automatically. More of these pieces are starting to become available too, right? When we first talked going back several years ago, this was pretty much brand new silicon uh, design and you didn't really have all these pieces. That's correct. So nowadays it's a, it's a good thing that we can see that for instance, the bit money uh, is getting to the GCC. We, we will see the P extension soon as well, vector the same story. But then this comes to the ratified or closely ratified extensions. But there is always a chance where you need to do something special because even these ones uh, don't meet the requirement. For instance, in the case of some kind of signal processing or wireless communication, you need to maybe go into specific, really specific instructions and extension, and then you may leverage this automation. One of the big challenges with RISC V has always been, what do you do about the RTL? What do you do about verification? How do you make sure it's really going to work as you think it's going to be, as your design is supposed to be, and then put it out in the marketplace and have it actually function as it's supposed to? Where are we now in that progression? Yeah, well, we are progressing there as well. There is a, a group, a compliance group, that takes care of checking that if, as a vendor, if you implement something, that you actually implemented that according to the specifications. So the you know, community is investing a huge effort in that in there, because it makes sense. We as a vendors, we, is, uh, we invest a lot of effort into the verification as well. And there are companies who, uh, you know, who are focused only on the verification, just to be sure that if you have risk five CPU and you claim that you have IMC, whatever, that you actually have it and it works according to the specification. So this is something ongoing. We are not there yet, for sure. We also invest a lot of, lot of effort into this uh, area because we would like to have the you know, best in class CPUs. And uh, if you claim that you are risk five compliant, that you are ready and another challenge that goes along with that is when you think about risk five a lot of the use has been as specialized accelerator type of chips 
that really has to function as part of a system, whether it's in a package, whether it's built onto an SOC. So now you really have to characterize this in a very efficient way too, right? Right, yeah. So everything has to work together. I mean, uh, if you design the accelerator and you put it into the bigger system where you may have one or actually tens or hundreds of accelerators, then you have to be sure that everything works together and you need to put a lot of effort into verification to, to say uh, or claim or be sure that uh, you are fine and everything works as expected. When you look back to a couple of years ago versus where we are today, how much progress do you see in terms of, I can walk in now and create my own risk five design and I'm pretty sure it's going to work versus what it was a couple of years ago? It depends. I mean, if you, uh, if you are like a new vendor or a new student who would like to create something from scratch, then on the SDK side, it's, it's much uh, mature. So we can just take GCC, it works, it has plenty of extensions already in there. And uh, from this point of view, if you are staying within uh, ratified extensions, the part is kind of done at a good shape. Now, if you look at the RTL, and if we would like to create something uh, something from scratch again, then we have a specifications that are ratified at this stage. Everything is there. So you have all you need to start a design from scratch if you need or want to. So this is a, this is a big step uh, because uh, it uh, hasn't been like that. Uh, but nowadays, it's really in a good, good shape, I think, and allows people to to start you know, new designs if they want to. Or they can just, as I mentioned at the beginning, if they are interested in only just playing with that at the universities, they can just download the open source implementations and there is quite a few of them already. And they can just start uh, or put these designs into FPGAs and experiment with the RISC-V because uh, they, in this case, they can just take the RTL that's already there, SDK as well, combine these together and have very nice design in a you know, short time. So where does this go next? What do you see RISC-V doing that it's not doing today? What, what's the changes that are coming down the pike? Well, we, we will see uh, more adoptions in uh, various uh, fields. So for instance, I believe that we will see RISC-V in the automotive and functional safety domain more often than we can see nowadays. We will see them uh, in, the, in the HPC or server domains in, uh, in a couple of years. Again, we are not there yet, but I think that we will be there uh, uh, soon. Maybe a bit, uh, better adoption on the AI or machine learning because this is still moving target. And for many people, it means many things. So RISC-V can be really important there because it allows these innovations, these changes according to the algorithms that the people need to have. And all in all, it's gonna towards to the high end. So right now we can see that uh, it's mature for the embedded. We can see that a lot of vendors have the CPU is there, they are going well, and we will see the shift uh, in the couple of years to the high end. So we will see the CPUs that are able to run Android, and actually we have some of them in the prototypes already, uh, and we will see the adoptions later on. Uh, we will see also a growth in the ecosystem, uh, because ecosystem is important for RISC-V, and so we will see that the ecosystem will be bigger and bigger in the future with more things. Maybe in one day we will have uh, something like a mobile phone that's based on RISC-V, uh, not only on the hardware level, but maybe also on the software side where we can have uh, some kind of market with the RISC-V native applications and so on. So I think that there is a bright future for RISC-V and uh, you know, we'll be part of that for sure. Senator Perkrill, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.